I knew that something was wrong even before I knew that he was gambling. He has none of my money. I never lend him money. Hello and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. Today I'll be discussing the experiences of being close to someone with problem gambling. We are joined by Cherie, whose partner currently has problem gambling. Her story is important because it focuses on how she has managed to set boundaries for herself to continue to live in the situation and maintain her family. Through the Gambling Impact Society, Cherie is a regular presenter for the Consumer Voices Community Education Sessions. She is here today to share her perspective and to share her story. Hello, Cherie, and welcome to the program. Hi, good to be here. Thank you for having me. Before we begin, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, Cherie? I have been um, married uh, 22 years to my husband, and we have six children. I have a job. I work in um, disability during the day, and then I have my own business as well. I teach piano, and it's actually quite doing quite well. And, of course, I do the speaking here. When did you start to notice that gambling was becoming a problem for your partner? Well, I knew that something was wrong even before I knew that he was gambling. Because we weren't uh, living together before we got married. So I think in a lot of ways that hid the problem. But then after we got married, very soon, like just a couple of weeks, you know, um, money would go missing and he'd disappear for for a long time and stay out all night and come up with these incredibly weird reasons for this time that was lost. And then sometimes he'd get caught in the lie. And I just... uh, I couldn't work out what was wrong, but I knew something was wrong. Do you know how long he's had the gambling problem for? Well, he offers up that he's only had it since he came to Australia. But a friend of mine who knows him for a long time, longer than me, said that he was uh, gambling in Indonesia, that his um, father used to take him to the clubs or whatever it is over there. And he would sit outside the club, but he would, waiting for his father but the people would come out of the club with lots of coins in their pocket and you know he'd hear them shaking in Mm. his pocket in their pockets and he got the idea that going to these places meant money but he did come to Australia to try and leave that behind and for a while he did and then he went on a holiday where part of the holiday was to go to a casino somewhere and he won $10,000 at the casino and that's got him started again. And since then, he hasn't been able to stop. And I think it's, it's more, than 20, more than 25 years. Has it been really financially crippling at all? Very, very, very crippling, especially even the more when I didn't know what was happening because I had no basis to be withholding money from him. Or uh, uh, and no reason to not be working with him, you know, to to bring up our children. And of course, I needed him really mm. Mm. because I had children and I really needed someone to be able to help. And we did have money. We had money through the government, of course, for the kids. But you know, I always had the hope that he would uh, make a lot of money. But whatever he seemed to do didn't seem to work out. And then um, he finally did get work. And no money came in from the work. And Mm. um, we went through many times, especially when after all the children were born and I was ill, I had gallstones and I was turning yellow and I was losing a lot of weight. I was having nausea and the house we were living in, they asked us to move and we had to find a place to go. And there was, he wouldn't do anything about it. He, instead of stepping up and being a hero for us and really providing for us and getting that, you know, that feel as mm. a man, yep. look what I've done. Instead of doing that, he went, he went bankrupt. Mm. Mm. And of course, as a bankrupt, he no longer could take any loans. Mm. So he mm. was happy that the problem was off him, but of course it fell on me and I couldn't do much about it. So I was ill and I had a lot of children and it still continued with a difficulty for a space of 10 years. But mm. Mm. Uh, I did find out about his gambling um, in that course at that time. And I was able to, to take back control of the money. So whatever money I did have was mine. So that was helpful when I found out about, about his problem. 
and then it was after I learned how to get better from my own illness I got stress illnesses from the problem it took me a while to get better and while I was getting better I still kept having waves of the problem physically mm, coming back mm, mm. but then when I finally did get better and started getting over it for about a year now I've been working two jobs so now there isn't much of a financial problem now but there has been for almost 20 years do you have any strategies to minimize his spending he has none of my money i never lend him money i tell my children never to lend him money i tell his family and everybody do not give him any money anything that he could get that could cause him to take a loan of my name is all locked away he's not allowed in the bedrooms where people have might have money now he can't go and get loans because he's been bankrupt twice. So if he was to be bankrupt a third time, we were warned. I was warned through my counsellor that if he was to go and do that, he would get himself in trouble. So that warning has come back to him from the counsellors and he hasn't got himself into debt again. So, you know, being aware of what could come to him has helped him, not giving him any extra money, not having access to anything that's mine. The computers and things like that, he doesn't, he can't get into them or got passwords on them. It is a little bit sad, I feel, for him because his life is so such in a box. Hmm. But he has his own income and I don't try to stop him totally. I, I, he's got his own income and I say to him, it's best not to gamble. You're wrecking your life. You're wrecking our marriage. You're wrecking your family. But in the end, he's got to pull himself out of the problem. I can't. I can't get him free, you know, and I, I got to look after my own health. And while I, I was trying to pull him out of his problem, I was getting sick. Does he acknowledge the problem? No. Has he ever tried to take on recovery or? One time I got him to go to counselling, but that didn't last long. As soon as the counsellor zeroed in on his problem, he took off, you know, because mm. I, I feel for him, you know, to finally realise you're the problem and that you've done all these horrible things. I, I actually don't know how people could face face that reality, but, you know, he needs to so that he doesn't continue mm. to be a horrible person doing all these horrible things. Why do you think he turned to gambling? Well, I think he saw it as a way to get rich, a way to prosperity. And then when he was growing up in Indonesia, he lost a lot of family. He lost several si siblings in terrible circumstances and I think he needed to get away from that from the, the terrible things that he was going through and he saw gambling as a way to make money so it was like a double good thing for him now I think he also goes to forget all mm. the terrible things he's done and as soon as we start to get closer and he starts to have to think about his behavior he it's not long before he's gone again and the same with the distance has come back up because he can't face it yet. It's, it's too much for him to face. Has it changed the relationship over the years? Was it, was it always like this or has it been a progression? Oh, definitely. I was madly in love when I met him. He was, he was the dream that I had wanted. Uh, he, he was from a good family and he hadn't had a girlfriend. Um, I had, I wanted that. And he was a well-spoken and well-educated man. He was gentle, you know, cared for animals and, and cared for children. He wouldn't hurt anybody um, and a real family man. And I was madly in love. And, and you know, I wish that it was still like that, but it's like I have to face the truth as well. But I still care for him. I still enjoy the relationship we have as long as I, I keep my own space. You know, I have a lot of boundaries with him and, it's a little bit lonely, I guess, but I've got on with life. I mean, my bachelor's degree is almost finished. I've only got one subject left and I want to go on to a master's degree. I want to grow my business. So I have lots of plans to keep me happy and I want to stay with my husband. So even though I still have a little bit of a hope, but not too much because it's too painful to worry all the time about whether he's going to get free. So better for me just to enjoy the relationship that I've chosen to have and minimise all the difficulties.
as much as I can. And the house isn't in, isn't in his name or my name, so it's a little bit safe. So he mm. can't. Think. So the things I've done to set set myself some nice safe boundaries. And even though it does affect our relationship, I'm still having a relationship with. I still enjoy being with him, and I still have hope for our family. And he's still mm. he's still a good man. And it's so hard. Even sometimes I wonder how can two things be at the same time. He's still a good man, but he has a terrible problem that he won't face. You're listening to Wellbeing, where we are discussing the experiences of being close to someone with a gambling addiction. My guest today is Cherie, whose partner currently has problem gambling. Has he foregone things that were once important to him because of the addiction? Definitely. Um, well, he doesn't sleep well. He doesn't have many friends anymore except gambling friends. He's not even visiting his family as much as he was before. He doesn't eat well. He doesn't exercise much. And the happy man that he used to be, you know, we used to play ping pong together. He's not that man anymore. So he's, he's lost a part of himself. I also think that he's lost a part of his intellect because uh, he, he just doesn't seem the, the man that he was, you know, intellectually. There's been lots of lo- losses along the way for him and the loss of his hope, you know. The, he wanted to be this man who, who, you know, supported his wife and his children and they all looked up to him, you know, because he was such an example. Mm. And he really lost, has lost that, you know. With those boundaries in place you mentioned, when you're do when the family's spending time together, how do you go about that? Well, he's often just talking, and they talk with him. We don't go out a lot together. Part of that's been because we didn't have a vehicle for twelve months, but I, I have one now. And he tends to not be as involved with us because he's he's out a lot at the clubs. So there's only times when we're home or we're going out somewhere, like a funeral or a wedding or. And actually, we don't have really have any problem then. He's just his normal self, just chatting and talking with the family, talking about his life and his family's life. And all the children talk to him then. Nobody is angry at him. Did you find it hard at first to admit that he had a problem or? I did very much. I, You know, I, I said to him, do you have a gambling problem? And he says, no, why would I gamble? And you can never win when you gamble. You'd have to be, you know, not smart to gamble. I asked him, oh, do you have another little family somewhere? Do you have a drug addiction? Do you have debts that I don't know about? And, you know, all his answers were no, 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 of course not. But then it, I was walking through the house and I suddenly, I knew just like that, I knew that he had this problem and I started to shake. I shook mm. and I, my stomach dropped and I felt that white, that coldness, you know, that comes over you. It's like a coldness mm. and a heat and sweat. And I had to ring his family and said, is this true? Does he really have this problem? And his brother said to me, yes, my brother has a gambling problem. And then his family came around and we had a family meeting where it was put to him, do you have this problem? Every, we all have problems. Everyone has their own battles and challenges. And no one's saying that we're better than you are. We all have problems. You know, we need to know, do you have this problem? And then he says, yes. And I felt so angry. He lied to me. Plus, I needed him so much. I, I just thought, how can this person who's been with me all this time now admit to it and he's been lying and I felt so angry and his family tried to help they really stepped in then to try and settle us down settle us back into a marriage talk to him talk to me I think you know um the Asian people are very good at trying to keep marriages together the Asian families Hmm. you know they and even my father and my mother they were all working together to try and keep the family together and bring about a um a good outcome. Actually, my counselor said this is called family theory. You know that the the family fits together like a clock, and then when something breaks or someone dies, everyone moves in tighter. And and I found it it was exactly like that. Everyone just moved in tighter around us to try and help us, and uh, took over his finances for a while. So even I didn't have to worry about it. You know, made him pay things and fought with him about it for quite a few years. They really stepped in to help. 
but it was still hard for me and it's still hard it still hurts it's like mm. cancer mm. you know that is always eating away at you you know i need this to go away you know for us to move forward i need this to go away it's hard to make plans for the future when you know you've got these problems you know mm. like i can't imagine going overseas because it's means i have to pay for him to go overseas he won't pay for that and then i'm going to be angry that i've had to pay for him so mm. i have to face up going alone or being angry so mm. <laughs> sometimes mm. it's hard to move forward to find a way forward but we've managed it i mean it's been it's been 16 years now since i've known about his problems so we've managed 16 more years together how do you go about that long term thinking knowing that this that the, that there is this problem well i made the choice that i wanted to stay and that was something that i did in the counseling i talked about my mind and my heart during the counseling they gave me plenty of room to just talk and talk and talk no one gave me any they didn't tell me to leave they didn't tell me to stay and i just kept saying i want to stay i i don't want to give up this is important to me and after discovering that this was me this is what i wanted then it's like you've made that you've set that foundation and then how do i go about living this life mm. and then i found to do that i've had to really look after myself i i had counseling for five years but i don't need it anymore it doesn't get me down anymore like it used to but i had to to find a way to live and i take a daily pattern so i spend i have a christian faith so i spend time in prayer every day and i also get up and i run Mm. I get up and run one one hour every day in the morning before work and I find that I just don't feel stressed about things you know if I really look after myself and make sure that I don't do too much housework you know I um I go and practice my piano and I'm I had singing lessons and and you know I'm succeeding in life like at my work I'm running a choir for the disabled and you know my business is taking off and in my church i'm a leader you know which is unusual for a female leader without a husband you know and so i'm succeeding in life and that has really helped me to stay with my husband to make this life work because his problem is his problem but it's in a way it's my problem too because i'm living with him because it's not stopping me from having the life that i wanted I'm doing okay. I'm doing more than okay. Hmm. Is the way that Australia, Australian society views gambling culturally, is that a healthy view? I think that they don't understand what the harm is from gambling. They, like my mother used to say to me that, you know, I just go and put $5 in, in the machine and that's it, you know, that's gambling and and that's healthy, that's fine, because she'd go to bingo and she'd put five dollars through the poker machines and that's what people normally do. That's what and that's how it's seen as just fun, have fun. But there's a whole lot of people that are having such serious harm come from it. And in the area where I live, you know, one in ten, at least one in ten houses have a problem gambling, which means that they're having problems with getting food. They get, their children probably aren't having many clothes. They're going hungry at school. There's probably a lot of fighting. There could mm. be domestic violence. Mm. So, I, and you know, you think in Australia that there's nobody that's poor, and you can be on Centrelink money and still have nothing because of their, someone's gambling problem because they are siphoning money off you all the time. So you're living far below that poverty line of what it looks like on paper because um, you're not having the money that it looks like you have. You're not having the money for the bills and the money for the food because that's gone somewhere on these make-up bills that, hmm. that, that the gambler has made up that are absolutely necessary. These terrible situations why they need money or it's been taken from you. You know, sometimes uh, it hasn't been, it's been a long, long time now one time he took my card and he took three thousand dollars from my card and you know sometimes he took money from my wallet and occasionally he sold things like he sold his wedding ring that was very important to me because it had his name in it and 
any money that he got from taxes would disappear. You know, he would be using that. Any money that his family got gave him. Anything that he could get that would really be benefiting us would go to gambling. So the most part of of what he would bring into our lives is gone. So really, when you when you look at what him and I are together, it's better to look at me as a single person. But we are working, the GIS and other places are working to show that many, many people that are gambling are hurting and their families are hurting. And it's it's not just a little bit of hurting, it's a lot of hurting. So, you know, like the cigarettes, everybody smokes. My mother started smoking when she was 12 years old and she smoked for 50 years and then she never got cancer, but she weakened her heart, I think, and she passed away. And and now it's on all the packets. This product causes harm. You know, they're mm. horrible looking things, people with cancer on their face. And, you know, that's how I think that a healthy view of gambling should be. There should be signs everywhere. Gambling causes harm. Mm. And, you know, when mm. you come to, when the ads are on the television, they should be gambling causes harm, you know, not like just if you're having a problem, here's a phone number. There should be a big thing. Gambling causes harm. Gambling causes homelessness, broken marriages, um, domestic violence. You're listening to Wellbeing where we are discussing the experiences of being close to someone with a gambling addiction. My guest today is Cherie, whose partner currently has problem gambling. How should a society view gambling then? Like, where should they, how should they approach it? I think that it should be a lot more caution around gambling. You know, parents should treat it a little bit like drugs, you know. When you're growing up, the parents are going, don't take drugs, don't take drugs. You know, if you go and get something from the doctor... There's so many hoops that you have to, to jump through to get those dangerous drugs, you know. Uh, like uh, I had gallstones and I'd run off to the hospital with a, an attack and I'd have morphine. But you'd only get the one lot, you know, while you were having an attack. And um, you can't get things like that anywhere else. But, you know, gambling, something that's causing so much harm, it's so accessible to everyone and even to teenagers mm. online. And kids are hitting 18. And the, there's advertisements coming out, you know, come and have a, a schooly end of school uh, binge on the machines. I mean, why are they doing that? I mean, those kids are just starting their life. They don't need to be gambling as well. You know, people can't go to kids, teenagers, as soon as you finish 18, come and get drunk at the, at the club, you know. Mm. Hmm. They're not going to let people do that, you know. Yep. Don't do that to our children. Let them have a, a life, have a fresh start. It should be a lot more talking and consideration around hmm. the access to gambling and the publication of gambling and also some more support around people with problems and people's families with hmm. problems. And I think also too that, that it's important that we talk about not just gambling itself, but about the addictions that it can to gambling. Because I think in, in a lot of ways that people can forfeit getting help because of that of the stigma that's there in society. And I think that's why it's important. You know, we're talking right now about it. Yes, especially for the men, because the men are seen as the providers. So to have a problem like this is such a terrible thing for men because they're the ones who are meant to be there in the load and, you know, getting people houses and, and everything mm. that they need and supporting their family. And then they're having a problem like this. It's so embarrassing for them, you know, to be, to be facing it and then to be as well telling people about it. You know, what, there will be so much judgment. They'd be worried about the judgment that would come on them. But I found that the counsellors have been very supportive and they were very supportive of me when I rang in looking for help because I couldn't find help anywhere. I couldn't find help in my family, in his family, the sort of help that stopped me from getting sick. I couldn't find it. I tried to talk to people at church and they would say, stop saying bad things about your husband. And I would talk to other people and then people would 
blame me or distance themselves from me. And I ended up alone with this huge problem and all these children that needed me and all this responsibility and nobody to help me. And then um, I just got on my knees and I said, oh, God, I really need help. I'm in a mm. terrible mm. place. And, you know, this thought came in my mind, ring the gambling helpline. So I rang the gambling helpline and I found they were so supportive. I was able to speak for hours, literally hours, speak, cry, get angry, just talk, let my feelings go all over the place. There was never any judgment. No one was trying to rush me off the phone. And then um, they even got me counselling. Within a couple of days, they had arranged counselling for me, very close to me. And so I started having a couple, a couple of hours of counselling a couple times a week, you know, to start getting better. But straight away, I did start getting better. And because I got better, my children got better. Mm. And because our family started to get better, it helped my husband because his family was no longer falling apart. What would be the take-home from this interview you'd want people to remember the most? You know, I didn't know what was wrong with me. My mind used to be in a swirl and I didn't understand how I had turned into this bad person because, you know, there was so much gaslighting going on and um, I didn't even know myself anymore and I didn't understand what was wrong with me. I didn't know why I was suffering. I didn't know why... I wasn't coping and I really had to go looking for help and I couldn't find it and I found it in counselling. So my take home that I would give everybody is if you think someone might be gambling, you've got to do something about it. You've got to take back your health and you've got to get help, you know, to deal with this very big problem. And if you're gambling, I'd say reach out. No one's going to judge you. They are going to help you. They only want to help you and your family to have a better life. I'm incredibly grateful to have spoken with you today, Cherie. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> My guest today was Cherie, collaborator with the Gambling Impact Society and someone with first-hand experience of being close to someone with problem gambling. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins, and all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.